what's the theme? The theme is what you see is what you get. How do you develop new, sustainable processes to deal with three extremely difficult to decarbonize sectors? We got energy, we got fuels, we got chemicals. That's what we're going to talk about. So I want to start, though, with an open question. What are we breathing right now? You're breathing all kinds of molecules. Those of you online, those of you in the room, different types of molecules, depending on where you are on Earth. But generally speaking, this is what's going into and out of your lungs at this very moment. Many of you already knew, 78% nitrogen. Okay, Two nitrogen atoms coming together, forming one of the strongest bonds on Earth that's coming into our, into our lungs. We're spitting it right back out, not able to do anything with it. I'm going to come back to that in a second. Oxygen. Very important, clearly we need that to live. We're breathing water, we're breathing argon. Did you know that about 1% of what you're breathing right now is argon? Okay, interesting. Carbon dioxide, not, not, a, not a friend to many these days, 400 parts per million and climbing. Those are the big five, but it's not the only stuff we, we're breathing in and out. We got neon, we got helium, we got methane, we got krypton. It turns out there's a lot of important stuff that's in the air, no matter where you are across the globe, that I view as a resource. And the open question is, how can we make use of that as a resource and perhaps find some of those elements and molecules that we need to live and survive and live a high quality of life? How can we, how can we make use of that resource? Now, I want to get back to nitrogen for a second. It's one of the strongest bonds in all of nature. And yet, it's also one of the most important elements, nitrogen, in our bodies. Nitrogen is the key ingredient in amino acids. Amino acids are what form proteins, it's what forms enzymes, it what forms your DNA. We cannot live without it. We're breathing it in and out, but we can't make use of it. How do we get it? Many of you might recall the natural nitrogen cycle. Okay? Lightning strikes. That provides the energy strong enough to rip those bonds apart, fix that nitrogen, get it into the ground. Our, the crops or trees or fruits and vegetables make use of that fixed nitrogen. We can either eat that directly, get it into our bodies, or we can eat the animal that perhaps ate that crop. So let me ask you this what if question. What if I snap my fingers and the natural nitrogen cycle ceased to exist at this very moment forever? How are we going to feed people? Got good news for you. Scientists and engineers have already figured it out. <laughs> One of the greatest achievements of humankind called the Haber-Bosch process. You take that nitrogen from the air, you separate it out, purify it, and you react it with hydrogen. That hydrogen comes not from some pool or some reservoir. comes from natural gas, typically. It comes from fossil fuels. You're basically ripping the hydrogen off of those hydrocarbons, sticking it onto nitrogen to make NH3, ammonia. You all know the smell of ammonia. It's the smell of pine salt. Take a look at that scale, 180 billion kilograms a year production of ammonia. That's to feed people. It's to feed us. 180 billion kilograms a year. How do we make sense of that? Divide by 8 billion people on Earth. That's over 20 kilograms per year per person on Earth. That's over 50 pounds of ammonia is what you all each account for. That process is, takes that nitrogen from the air, the hydrogen from the ground, from hydrocarbons, makes that ammonia. We put it into the ground. That goes into the crop. It goes into the animal. That's what we were all eating. That's how we get the fixed nitrogen in our body. 50% of the fixed nitrogen in your body touched one of those iron nanoparticles that you see on the screen that's inside one of several hundred Haber-Bosch facilities around the globe. Really important chemical process. Ammonia is one of 70,000 different molecular products that we produce for our global societal needs. A few other ones here, hydrogen, 70 billion kilos a year, gasoline, a trillion kilograms a year, plastics at over 300 billion kilograms a year. A lot of science and engineering has gone into create what I, again, consider to be one of the greatest achievements of humankind of being able to take basically stuff from the ground, fossils, fossil fuels, or stuff from the air, and do the chemical reactions to make the things that we need. And at low cost, a lot of this stuff on the screen, it's like 50 cents or a dollar per kilogram. When you go to the grocery store, what can you buy for 50 cents or a dollar per kilogram? And we get it out to billions of people across the globe. But these are imperfect processes. They're not sustainable, that's for sure. Rely on fossil fuels, it made a lot of CO2. And they're not equitable because they do reach billions, but not all billions equally well. So this is the opportunity to reinvent the future. And this is the question I will pose to you. What if we could develop renewable pathways, sustainable pathways, to convert the molecules that we're breathing right now into the fuels and chemicals that we need for a high quality of life across the globe? And that really drives the mission of our research group and many others on this campus and outside campus as well. How do you catalyze a sustainable future 
We aim to design catalyst materials that can do these chemical transformations, take molecules from the air that we're breathing, say, rip them apart, put them back together to make the products that we need, integrating renewables to the greatest extent possible, directly electrified processes, or using sunlight directly. You can make the fuels you need for transportation, the chemicals, uh, the building blocks, the fertilizers, et cetera. Perhaps we can make that directly renewably or make the molecular intermediate sustainably and then feed that into the modern chemical industry as we know it. And this is the opportunity for everyone on Zoom and in this room to contribute. There's a lot of tech that needs to be developed, but we need innovation in finance, innovation in business, innovation in policy, innovation in sociology, society. This is, this is a society level question of how can we make all this work and there's an opportunity for everybody to contribute. Now, here at Stanford, we don't do this alone. There's, I mentioned, I uh, work in a team of people. This is the SunCat Center for Interface Science and Catalysis. We're a partnership between Stanford University and SLAC National Accelerator Lab. Here are some of uh, the people that I work very closely with on this, including one of our next speakers, Professor Jen Anbao. And we're all about how do we transform that future, applying our trade with the different resources and intellectual capacities that you find at a national lab and a university and teaming up with a center that is about 70 or 80 strong, driving towards that overarching mission. Now, I'd like to give you a couple of brief examples with the rest of my time. I want to talk about hydrogen for a second. Hydrogen is already a big ticket molecule, 70 billion kilograms a year production rate. And again, almost all of it is made unsustainably. How could you make it sustainably? Well, one approach is you could take photovoltaics, which provide renewable electricity, and feed that into a water electrolyzer so those H2O molecules get converted into H2 and to O2. That's one way you can make it. The problem is, and we, those are commercially industrialized processes today, the problem is that it's way too expensive compared to the current price. So it's about four to five dollars per kilogram instead of one dollar per kilogram, which is about the spot price in the US. So the US Department of Energy recently launched what's called an Earth Shot. This is akin to the Moon Shot, which was the Apollo program, <laughs> to make hydrogen at $1 for one kilogram within one decade. And a lot of R&D is needed. We've done the techno-economics. Our partners have done the techno-economics. We need to move about 100 levers in the right direction to innovate and get the price down. The one thing I wanted to mention for today was well, the many levers, one of those is the catalyst. The, the commercial technology today, a lot of it relies on platinum and iridium. These are very scarce metals, extremely expensive. How do you develop a good hydrogen catalyst that doesn't have precious metals? And so the example I want to give you is we look to biology for answers. Biology, enzymes, they do chemical transformations extraordinarily well. And Mother Nature doesn't have a whole lot of precious metals as a resource, so it makes use of with what it's got. So here are two such enzymes, hydrogenase and nitrogenase. I'd love to get down to the nitty-gritty detail into the physics and the chemistry on how it works, but let me just say, at the end of the day, it's computational modeling and understanding how those enzymes work that helped inform materials that could serve as catalysts. This pointed to a material called molybdenum disulfide. You can actually buy it in the hardware store. It's a great lubricant, kind of similar to graphite. Turns out that the theory pointed us in the direction of the edges of that material to be very active. Now, when I was a postdoc at the Technical University of Denmark outside of Copenhagen some years back, I investigated, along with others, that material. We found that the theory was right. It was on the money. We found, wow, this could be a very active and, and great catalyst for hydrogen. We started the research group here. Jabot and Jakob were two of our early stage researchers, making nanowires, nanoporous materials, small molecular clusters. Some of these images you see on the screen are atomically resolved. The one on the top right is a cluster of 16 atoms, three that are molybdenum, 13 that are sulfur. We image it. We try to understand at the atomic level how these things function. And with that insight, that provided a whole new toolkit of new types of catalysts that we could develop. A lot of fundamental science here, very important. We also want to know how would this thing work in real technology. We partnered with a company in Connecticut called Proton Onsite, later acquired by a Norwegian electrolysis company called Nell. And here's Mackenzie and Lori, who took some of our catalysts, scaled it up in the lab, shipped it off to Connecticut. They put it exactly into the same electrolyzer that they sell. This is what you're seeing on the screen. They usually sell that with platinum and iridium. They integrated the non-precious metal variety that came, coming from our lab, and it worked. They ran it for two months continuously, absolutely no issues, 
was stable, it was active, it was exactly what we expected it to do in a real world format, but we still have big challenges to make those catalysts even better and better because they're good, they're still not competitive with platinum to the extent that we can replace them just yet. But that's one of the key areas that we work on. Now we could dive more into hydrogen, but just to give you a different flavor, we're trying to do the same type of thing with carbon dioxide. That 400 parts per million that you're breathing right now, if you want to make a carbon-based product, and many of our many of the molecular products across the globe are carbon-based, imagine grabbing it from CO2 and putting it into an electrolyzer process with water. You want a catalyst that rips the bonds of CO2, rips the bonds of water. You have all these H's, O's, and carbons, and you reattach them and make the product that you want. Much more complex chemistry. Three of our early stage scholars here, Kendra, Atasha, and David, focused on that reaction. They were able to show that at room temperature and room pressure, they were able to take that carbon dioxide and that water, rip them apart, and put them back together to make all kinds of very big ticket important molecules in our world. Ethylene, ethanol, methanol, glycol aldehyde, acetone, ethylene glycol, whether it's antifreeze or a plastic precursor, these are really, really important molecules. They showed that we could do it. But again, there's a lot of fundamental science that we still need to do to innovate on this. We also need to, work to talk about how to scale this to outside the walls of Stanford. How can we scale to impact? And that was to touch on some of the themes that were brought up by Tomas earlier and our president, Mark Tessier Lavinia. And so with that, many of our students are doing that. They have the courage to take some of those innovations in the lab. They're going out and founding companies on CO2 electrolysis, on nitrogen fixation, on hydrogen peroxide production. And they're taking those innovations and really trying to move and shake in the real world and develop commercial scale renewable technologies based on that. Now, I'm super excited about them. I champion them. I, I, I celebrate them and, and support them. We need a lot more. And that one of the things that I have realized is not, not all the students have that courage to take the risk of starting a new enterprise like they did. There's probably 10 times as many out there that are just as capable can, how can we help de-risk things so they're willing to take that jump? And so with that, I'm really excited about the, one of the topics brought up earlier by our president, the Stanford Door School of Sustainability Accelerator. That's exactly what we're trying to do. I'm working together with a team of scholars in the new school to really form this accelerator. And one of the many things it's trying to do is take the basic research that we do so well on this campus and really take it down the line. This is not just true for tech, it's true for policy, economics, business, et cetera. How can we get that, those, those new ideas and concepts and innovations from their basic research stage into a state where we can de-risk them and then ultimately get them off campus and have impact. So with that, I will uh, wrap up and thank the team members that I get to work together with every single day on the projects that I talked about. Happy to engage with you later on and thank you for your time and attention.